Long before there was Advil and penicillin, there was a medicine whose legendary reputation was as large as its ingredient list was complicated. On this episode of Footnoting History, we'll be talking about one of the earliest wonder drugs that claimed to be able to cure whatever ailed you, Theriac. Hi, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Kristen, and today I'd like to tell you about a cure for a sore throat and itchy skin and coughing, and stomach trouble, and poisonous bites, and migraines, and epilepsy, and the plague. And that's not even the full list. Theriac could allegedly do it all. For over 1,500 years, Theriac was the solution to a wide range of pre-modern health concerns and was a famous panacea, a cure-all for every ailment, both real and potential. Theriac's origin story is almost as grand as all of the wondrous promises it made. Many early recipes for Theriac attribute the cure to the 2nd century Greek physician named Galen, but the medicine was popular long before his time and was by no means confined to his corner of the Mediterranean. In legend, Theriac is a derivative of another medicine called Mithridite, which was named after an ancient king of Pontus who ruled around the year 120 BC in what is now modern-day Turkey. King Mithridates IV was worried that he had a lot of enemies, so, according to the legend, he found it worth his while to create a poison antidote that had lots of ingredients, and he took a daily dose as a protective measure against any would-be lurking foes. Fast forward to the 2nd century AD, and Galen, who was a physician to the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, took an interest in Mithridium, as the medicine was by then known, and Galen did a bit of tinkering with the formula based on what one of Nero's physicians had allegedly been doing with it a little earlier. He branded his updated version of Mithridium as Galen, or Galen's Theriac, adding his personal stamp to the original Greek word Theriakos, which literally means that which pertains to wild beasts and reptiles. This medicine was often simply just referred to as Theriac, or occasionally treacle, which is a bastardization of the word Theriac. By either name, Theriac carried the cachet of a proven ancient cure and worked according to the dominant perception of the time, that one's health was dependent on the relative proportions and conditions of the four fluids of the body. These were understood to be blood, phlegm, collar, and black bile. One state of wellness was based on an internal mix of these four things that corresponded to the four elements, and this mix was precarious and subject to each individual, to the environment, and to change. Every person, plant, animal, and mineral in the universe had its own unique makeup of these four qualities. This system of belief was called humoralism, and the same Galen behind Theriac promoted this classical theory, which ultimately became very popular in the medieval and early modern West. If the body's humors were out of whack, sickness struck, and according to this medical philosophy, something needed to prod them back into place. Enter Theriac which owed its wonder drug reputation to the belief that it was the best at restoring humoral balance in the body. Anglo-Saxon England was impressed. A 9th century medical manuscript called Bald's Leech Book has a recipe for theriac in its second section, which begins with the claim that King Alfred the Great requested that the Byzantine Patriarch of Jerusalem send him a bunch of recipes that he liked. Included in the list that follows is a recipe for theriac. There is nothing very concrete to back up King Alfred making this request, but the general path of travel does check out. Theriac found its way into the West by a few different routes. One of these routes was Italy. Italy was a site of transmission of medical knowledge from the classical world via the Arab world, and places like Salerno in the south of Italy were aware of humoral theory and Galenic medicine early on. From there, the usual Italian city-state suspects like Venice, Padua, Genoa, and Milan took ready-made theriac to European markets, but they were also competing with merchants from Cairo and Byzantium. Even if Alfred didn't literally get a list of recipes from the head of the Byzantine church in Jerusalem, the relationship between theriac and the Eastern world was established enough by the later 800s to make the claim believable. Theriac continued heading west in the following centuries, ultimately making its way to European colonies far across the Atlantic. It also went east, and there is evidence for theriac being used in areas of China and Japan. It remained popular long into the 18th century, and was one of the earliest brand medicine success stories. There are several different versions of the recipe for theriac, but all of them have a ton of listed ingredients. 
Theriac belonged to a pharmacological classification known as compound medicines by virtue of the many ingredients and often complex processes that went into making them. If a remedy had only one or a few ingredients, it was known as a simple. That was definitely not Theriac. In fact, Theriac was subcategorized as a complex compound and with a lot of good reason. One recipe found in a mid 12th century medical text from Southern Italy called the Antidotarium Nicolae lists 105 separate ingredients, three of which are themselves compound medicines. Some theriac ingredients like garlic, fennel, and garden cress were generally easy to find, especially if you were looking for them in Europe or around the Mediterranean. Other things were not so easy to grab from the common garden. This same recipe for theriac requires 10 separate tree resins or gums, such as calamite storax, which maybe you've never heard of, as well as turpentine, frankincense, and myrrh, which maybe you have. A lot of theriac preparations came in powder form, thus the recommendation that it be mixed up with water. Theriac, if it were being made according to its recipe's specifications, probably didn't taste very good, which is probably why it is often recommended that it be taken with honey and wine, both things like water that a person could reasonably come by. But that's not the case for all theriac ingredients. That's not the case for a substance that comes from the perineal glands of beavers called castorium. That's definitely not the case for mummy. That's right. Some recipes for theriac really do call for an ingredient derived from corpses, and to be fair to theriac, it was not the only medicine that did that. Mummy, or mummia, originally just referred to a type of asphalt called bitumen that came from the mountains of Persia and was used in the East in treatments for cuts and bruises. Picture tar and you'll understand why the Persians called bitumen mummia, which was a local word for wax. The ooze that came from dead bodies looked pretty similar to some people. When the Baghdadi physician Razis wrote about mummia in the 9th century, he meant bitumen, and that's what the Persian physician Avicenna meant too about a hundred years later. But that was not how medieval Western medical writers understood the term. Constantine the African, Gerard of Cremona, and Matthew Platerius, all famous and influential medical writers, were translating mummia as a substance that came from the tombs of the dead as early as the 10 hundreds, and that understanding went on for centuries. Mummy is one of those weird old ingredients, and it definitely doesn't stand alone in theriac recipes. Let us not forget that castorium. But with respect to ratios of weird to not weird ingredients, theriac's list is weighted toward the latter. You just have to get them all. Say you do find all the ingredients, then what? The manufacturing process for theriac seems, at first glance, pretty simple. All you need to do is grind up some stuff, Mix everything together with honey or spices, and let it age, preferably for a year. And many theriac preparations claim to be good for 40 more. But there is a lot of assumed knowledge hidden in this superficial simplicity. The limited instructions specify that you should only grind, quote, those things that need to be ground, end quote. But that's not super helpful, because they don't tell you which ones those are. You're just supposed to know. Also, there are different applications for every different ailment theriac claims to be able to cure. If you're suffering from a respiratory complaint, take it with wood sage. If your problem is jaundice, take it with hazelwort. If kidney stones are making you miserable, you need to take your theriac with grommel and celery. The recipe itself is silent as to diagnosing these illnesses. This can mean either that the one preparing and dosing theriac took the patient's word for it, or they were assessing the situation themselves. There is a bit of medical jargon embedded in many theriac recipes, which points to a level of professional expertise. The Antidotarium Nicolae version of the recipe assumes its audience will know what a trochee is when it recommends that a preparation be administered via one. It assumes it doesn't have to explain what a dram and a scruple are when it tells you these measurements are important. I will make no such assumptions. A trochee is a medicated lozenge, kind of like a Hall's cough drop. A dram is one eighth of an ounce, and a scruple is one third of a dram. Just for reference, two Samoa Girl Scout cookies weigh about one ounce, so about a quarter of a cookie is one dram. Perspective, you're welcome. All this is to say that theriac was a specialized, complicated, and expensive cure to make, so not many people actually made it. 
If you were in the market for Theriac, your best bet was to find a merchant who specialized in medicines. There were options. Making medicine was a way of making a living. Plenty of people were paid to do it. Apothecaries, along with people who sold spices and pepper, were the main source of medicinal retail in medieval Europe. There was a strong association between wellness and food, born of that humoral concept that the body could be influenced by outside factors. These trades all dealt in what was called spicery, which included medicines, but also exotic and complementary articles, like sugar, alum, and dried fruit. Apothecaries also sold wax, paper, and ink, but medicines were considered their primary products, sort of like the pre-modern world's version of Walgreens. The idea that pharmacy was a separate sphere of medicine was first introduced to the West by the Arab world. Apothecaries had a special skill set. In the 13th century, the Franciscan scholar Roger Bacon wrote that good apothecaries could manufacture compound medicines, and the really good ones were trained at Montpelier, which is in the south of France. Requisite skills included powdering, blending, filtration, distillation, and weighing, many of which are either named or implied in recipes for theriac. Advice manuals for physicians encourage their readers to ask patients a lot of questions, take their pulse, examine their urine, and give them an appropriate course of treatment. But as far as making any recommended medicines, many physicians outsource that work. A lot of medical practitioners actually found it handy to work in close proximity to apothecary shops, holding court outside, soliciting and diagnosing patients, and then sending them on inside to buy their cures. This uh, convenient relationship tended to be viewed with a healthy dose of skepticism, and occasionally towns cracked down on it, but it remained pretty common in many areas. As merchants who required access to foreign markets and a consistent pool of shoppers, apothecaries operated in an urban environment. London, for example, had a large number of shops clustered around Soper's Lane and Cheap, then and now near St. Paul's Cathedral of Princess Diana wedding fame. But there is evidence for the presence of apothecaries in at least 45 other English towns. There were also traveling spice peddlers who made their way through the rural communities, but without municipal regulators and scrutiny from trade organizations, these products were particularly suspect and of course not always available. Your best bet for finding Theriac then would be in the city and in an apothecary shop. If powdered gold or ambergris were also on your shopping list, you might be in luck if your apothecary had just purchased some from the ships coming in from India, the Middle East, and Ceylon by way of the Italian galleys. In the later Middle Ages, the Venetians had cultivated a reputation for producing and supplying the very best Theriac. Theriac was prone to being counterfeited, so they put a lot of resources and effort into publicizing that theirs was the real deal. The city devoted a whole civic ceremony to the preparation and legitimization of Theriac. Ingredients were displayed and inspected, then mixed up and sent on their way with official city approval. But demand was high and competition was intense. Other cities, such as Maastricht in the Netherlands, performed similar ceremonies to keep up. In the early 18th century, the Faculty of Medicine in Paris certified a Theriac Society, whose entire purpose was to publicly manufacture the medicine before releasing it into the marketplace. And it was in Paris in 1790 where the last such civic ceremonies devoted to Theriac took place. Doubts about the efficacy of Theriac started to appear in writing in the 18th century, after medicine began its turn from the humoral system. In 1745, the Cambridge-trained physician William Heberden published a pamphlet called Antitherica, Essay on Mithridatium and Theriac, where he just lambasted Theriac and its close associate Mithridite, which was also still around. Heberden laid into, quote, the injudiciousness, the ostentation and wantonness of this heap of drugs, end quote, and appealed to the College of Physicians, who had jurisdiction over pharmacology in England at that time, to end their support. Not long after, Theriac fell out of use in England, but you could still find it in the colonies. Areas of continental Europe were similarly slow to let go of Theriac, and references for it could still be found in German and French pharmacopias in the later part of the 19th century. But by the 20th century, the Western scientific community had largely turned to areas such as cellular biology, chemistry, pathology, and germ theory. Instead of sickness being due to an imbalance of humors, microorganisms like bacteria and viruses were understood to be to blame. Marie-Francois Bichat, Rudolf Virchow, and Louis Pasteur were by then the accepted authorities. A mythologized ancient king and classical Greek physicians were obsolete. 
For a long time, potential Theriac consumers believed that Theriac would work, and modern people generally want to know if it would. Is there anything in the long list of Theriac ingredients that could cure a migraine or save you from a poisonous bite? Does it bolster immunity and improve heart and liver function? Does it do anything that it says that it can? The short answer is no one really knows, but probably not. The longer, more ambivalent answer is, well, maybe, kind of, a few things could, but not for the reasons that pre-modern medical texts assumed. To date, there have been no modern empirical studies on the efficacy of theriac as a compound medicine. Individual ingredients, on the other hand, have been studied. It will probably come as no great surprise that garlic is good for you, and Louis Pasteur was the first to examine that in the 19th century. Since then, many studies have been conducted on the benefits of garlic, which has antimicrobial and antifungal and antiviral activities. It has antithrombotic and antiarthritic actions too, meaning it can help prevent blood clots and inflammation in the joints. It's good for a lot, but its presence doesn't mean that it was the magic ingredient that made good on all of Theriac's claims. Many other ingredients that show up in Theriac recipes, like ginger and St. John's wort, also have proven health benefits. Maybe they all combined some benefit or amplified one another's qualities. But what about that mummy? No modern studies have tested the medical efficacy of corpse juices, and I hope they never do, but we are left to wonder if maybe mummy was an active ingredient in Theriac, or if Theriac worked despite its inclusion, or if what people were calling mummy was something other than bitumen or material made from dead bodies. The same thing can be said for all those other more mundane ingredients. Many medical historians would agree that we cannot be 100% certain what was in these medicines at all. The long-lasting popularity of Theriac suggests that something about it did work, but it might well have been because of the atmosphere of healing that surrounded it, rather than any real, I'm doing air quotes here, you can't see it, but know they're there, any real therapeutic properties. This is something observed today in studies on the placebo effect. Analgesic responses can be prompted and maintained by expectations of cures rather than medically efficacious ingredients. Placebos have been shown to have demonstrably beneficial effects by what scholars have called the, quote, altering of the therapeutic environment, end quote. In other words, if you think it's going to work, it really well might. And it's not just that you've superficially fooled yourself. In the biz, this is called expectation theory. Taking a medically inert placebo or participating in the ritual of healing can produce a physical response that conforms to one's expectations. Preliminary neuroimaging studies on patients who were administered inert medicines have shown activation in the same brain centers that non-placebo medicines also triggered, instigating the same analgesic responses. Another study completed in 2001 found that subjects who received their non-placebo medicine from a doctor experienced more pain relief than their counterparts who got the same exact thing just by means of an IV that sat behind a screen. They didn't know they were being dosed, and they had no expectation of improvement. They did not report the same level of pain relief that their subject counterparts, who interacted with a doctor and knew that they were getting the medicine reported. If you had to pick one premodern cure to keep at the ready, Theriac was a good choice. For a long time, this complicated, legendary medicine enjoyed a reputation for efficacy. And who knows, something about it may have worked. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.